Hello, this is Tom Eschen, the host of this Power in Politics podcast, the conversations about the issues that matter the most with the people who are making those decisions, asking the questions to hold them accountable on the issues that matter to you, not only in New York, but beyond as well. Today, we sit down with Marcella Goheen, the founder of Essential Care Visitor, four years after her organization rallied at the Capitol in New York State to try and get better care for the individuals in nursing homes, her husband's in a nursing home. And four years ago, she couldn't see him in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. This conversation is also on the heels of her attending Governor Cuomo's testimony at Congress on his nursing home order during that pandemic. We go over a variety of topics with Marcella. So stay tuned and enjoy and also subscribe to our podcast now or watch on our YouTube page, CBS 6 Albany. Thank you very much, Amani Marcel. We really appreciate your time. Thanks for coming in. This is a big day for, for you and Essential Care Visitor, which four years ago today was something that you founded, right? Well, we founded it actually in March of 2020, yeah. the first day of when we were told we couldn't no longer see our loved ones in long-term care facilities. And today was actually our first rally where we right. were screaming outside of Cuomo's um, offices um, in the city to let us in to care for our loved ones. We were locked out. We'll get uh, into why you founded it in just a moment. Obviously, your husband uh, was the contact point for you inside the nursing home at that time. But we were just talking. You were at the testimony earlier this week. Uh, let's first, before we get to what you thought of it, we do have a snippet of what Governor Cuomo, former Governor Cuomo, had to say a, a portion of that during that testimony. Here's that snippet now. But even with all New Yorkers did, we lost far too many, and I'm sorry for every life lost. And of course, this is relating to that decision that he made, that executive decision. And, you know, there the arguments were made of whether it was through federal guidelines or not. And, and there was something as you held the press conference today at two o'clock, a, a Zoom conference with some advocates and yourself. You mentioned about just the these officials, they have data at their fingertips and they're making these decisions and there's people behind those decisions. Thinking about what Governor Cuomo had to say and maybe a little bit what you had to say today, what is your impression of those decisions and why they're so important? I think they're important because they're behind a desk making decisions, right? Um, and uh, when they're making um, policy or guidance in that situation during COVID, it was guidance that was being written of what would be the best way to handle hospital res patients going into nursing homes or not going into nursing homes. Um, it's an overarching, it reflects the overarching belief system that people don't matter in nursing homes, you know, that they're disposable, that they're storage spaces for humans, and any kind of decision that might have been made like that oh, supports the overarching belief system that our society has, that loved ones in nursing homes or humans in nursing homes um, aren't relevant. You know, um, humans that are disabled or aging or disabled and aging or chronically ill, they're not broken toys that you throw away. You know, nursing homes are homes for um, our loved ones. And my husband has been his home for nine years. So um, the guidance that was written was, was an oversight, another oversight that often happens in this industry where at the end of it, um, our vulnerable uh, residents get harmed and they die. Uh, you mentioned your husband there. Tell us a little bit what it was like in 2020, what it's like today in caring for him and the, the barriers that have still existed. So 2020 was, we were shell-shocked as daily family caregivers. We call ourselves essential care visitors mm -hmm. because we provide the bridge care daily, whether there's a staffing issue pre-pandemic, during the pandemic, and right now there's a horrible one, um, daily to bridge that care to keep them at their highest level of functioning. So when we were told we couldn't go in, that was shocking because we knew that that was a huge risk, that certain things weren't going to be happening for my husband and thousands of others in New York. So that's why we fought at Essential Care Visitor to put our energy on the map that we exist. There's 10% of us in each facility. Um, that's roughly our guesstimation. Um, and we provide the daily care. So it was probably one of the worst moments of my life. Um, I was separated from him for eight months and I ended up having to sue the facility in order to prove his federal right, his resident right, his ADA right, um, his human and civil right that he is allowed to receive his person who cares for him and bridges that care in an institutional setting. And you look at it, this is someone you love, 
right? It's and my it, husband, and, it, yeah. and it is his home, and that is our story. That's our legacy. He fell ill, and he's chronically ill, and he needs this kind of long-term service, uh, services and supports in a residential setting to keep him at his highest level of functioning, which is the obligation of any nursing home. So um, that moment in 2020, you know, we're still um, have PTSD from it. You know, we're still reeling as consumers because it hasn't gotten better in terms of the staffing. That's what I wanted to get to. You you held this four year of the rally today. Uh, you know, what has changed? Has anything changed since 2020? Of course, there was a different, it was a bit of a different world back then, but I think you were hoping is what you said today in a lot of cases that there would be a light shined on this. There, there was a light shined on it, but unfortunately this kind of advocacy are long and slow gains and the tragedy there is that people need to be fed, bathed, clothed today you know, because they can't do it for themselves. So the long term, the long gain advocacy that we get pushed back by the regulators, the providers, um, um, everybody's telling us, oh, it's a COVID thing, it's a COVID thing. Only in New York, it's a COVID thing because I have another loved one in Indiana in a long term care facility and they got over COVID two, three years ago. Mm. So it's very challenging to think that there was a light and that we were gonna do transformative programming and regulations in order to make sure this never happened again, whatever that means to anyone. For us, it means that we're gonna have quality care at the front lines, which is the resident right of every single vulnerable human that's in New York State right now, which is 0 0.06 of the population of New York. So what we're basically saying by not serving um, these services and supports is that they don't matter, and they do. They should be prioritized, we should invest in them, and we should absolutely create the transformative regulations and programmatic institutions in order to serve our loved ones who matter. So let's continue now to talk about the hearing with Governor, former Governor Cuomo. And you also, you, you mentioned the accountability factor. Mm -hmm. And to me, what you have been talking about, it doesn't just fall on maybe him, but also you said not everyone understands this and even the questioning that he received or even from the other lawmakers in the situation didn't go in far enough for you. Why is that? I think that it's another indicator that many people don't understand this space mm. because it is a moment in time when someone lives in a long-term care facility that you haven't gone through yet. And you think when you say nursing home, um, I'm, that's never gonna happen to me or I will never put my loved one in a nursing home. So I think all of that informs a societal denial that I'm not aging and it's never gonna happen to me until it does happen to you. So when it does happen to you, like it did to us, um, we, I had to learn everything, I've lived it for nine years, um, that I can to keep my husband in a dignified state in his chronic progression of his unfortunate illness and you learn everything you can about regulations about how to sustain someone at their highest level of functioning per what their resident rights are and I feel like the hearing was a lot of political theater 50% um, political theater and then 50% sort of maybe a little bit exploration of what we could do better but nobody had the answer of what we could do better and what we can do better is we can regard our vulnerable population in New York State as worthy of receiving what they need food clothing hydration um, bathing and when you have someone in a long-term care setting like that, they deserve to have what you get every day. So it's, an, it's, a plat, it's, it's sort of a belief system where the disabled and aging um, is at the bottom of the totem pole. Uh, so that's what was missing in, in, in the hearing, was that, that they're not regarding when they're putting pens to paper and making regulations and decisions and guidances, especially in the humanitarian crisis, the impact of that. Yeah, I was going to ask what you, because I, about, you led perfectly into what I was thinking of terms of what should come out of this. What did you want? I asked Elise Stefanik that outside, right after she was right. done questioning oh, former right. Governor Cuomo, I said, what did you want to accomplish? And she said, I wanted to get answers for the families. Right. So there are there are families that lost their loved ones during yeah. the heat of the moment, of course. Um, which is an absolute tragedy. And my heart's still broken for all of my husband's resident mates that all died yeah. within four days of each other. And he lived. Um, it makes my heart break just sitting here thinking about how their family members didn't get to say goodbye. Right. And, and that, um, is, that is a family. That's a community inside the nursing right. home, right? Thank you for saying that. Yeah. It is, it's become our family. That yeah. is our family. I need these services and supports in the nursing home. I cannot do it at home alone. And this is a community. Yeah. And a long-term care facility should be a community of care. It should be a family. Um, so 
so to your question about what could have happened or what should it be looking like, mm -hmm. like um, in terms of how we can change it, yeah. is to prioritize these vulnerable and follow the resident rights law, 483.10, which is every resident has a right to be maintained at their highest level of functioning. And what does that mean? They are obligated a facility to develop a person-centered care plan for your loved one. And that means hour by hour, medication, hydration schedule, toileting schedule, you name it, whatever their care needs are. And that is just not happening with one aide to 45 patients or one nurse to two floors. And there are horrific staffing ratios that are happening um, that are not delivering the highest level of care. So when you ask well, what could have been done better or how could we have explored that during the hearing, I don't think our politicians know enough about the space um, to actually make those kinds of adjustments to say out loud, other than everything is about money. You know, it's a funding issue. Um, but for, I've always said, you know, to care, it doesn't cost a penny. Deciding the profit margin of your profit of your business if I had a nursing home versus how much I'm going to put toward care and Governor Cuomo had a list of those reforms, you know, uh, mid pandemic as people were working on for reform and you know, none of that's being achieved, but yet the money's still flowing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you look at what the efforts have been. You go back to 2022 and uh, now Governor Kathy Hochul signed some minimum staffing requirements. And yes, that sounds in, in terms of hours and who's there. But we have reached out a few times about whether or not those homes, those facilities are being held accountable for that. And so far, there haven't been any fines. They, they can, say, can you tell us that they have been reviewed? It, the date was just want to make sure we get the dates right. January 2022 was when it came was when it was signed December 2022 is when it went into effect and then we continue to ask when and where some of these fines would be adjudicated and there haven't been any yet. Well, if you look closely at the federal rule, yeah. um, which came out in the past year, um, it says that each resident is required to receive 3.48 hours of care mm -hmm. a yep. day, right? But then it also has these conditions. If you're in a rural area, you have five years to implement that. If you're in a non-rural area, you have three years to implement that. If you can prove you have a staffing crisis, um, you get some kind of a pass. Um, if you have to also prove, though, that you're trying to get staff. So there's all these smoke and mirror dynamics that go on behind regulations that are written very neutral mm -hmm. um, in order to give people passes. And our advocacy from day one has been these are human beings. There's no passes on giving someone water. There's no passes on not bathing somebody. There's no passes on not brushing someone's teeth, you know. And um, again, these regulations five years, three years from now, I'm sorry, but we need my husband needs to eat today. So I'm trying to illuminate the reality that not a lot of people know because not everybody has a loved one in a nursing home. Again, you're talking about 111,000 beds, right? So of, of that 111,000, you probably have 10% of that of daily caregivers going in. So who goes to nursing homes? More people need to, but they need to be palatable enough so that people will wanna go. But at the same time, it begs the question of who cares, right? Who's caring? The families care, yeah. but then the systems and supports to support the family to care are also broken. So it's a whole chaotic mess. Yeah, and there, it's you, you. I think you mentioned you said you know 110,000 or whatever. They're directly impacted, but there is a ripple effect here. From and there are statistics, of course, that we know that the population is going to get older in New York okay. State. And then you look at the health care ripple effect after that, because right. you have individuals that may be receiving care, may not, and if they don't or what have you, they could have to end up in urgent care, hospitals, emer like those all are factors here at the same time too, right? There's across the healthcare spectrum. If you don't long-term address some of these needs at the end of the day, right? Correct. I mean, it could happen to you tomorrow. I wish it not. Mm -hmm. I can use our story. Mm -hmm. My husband got sick pre his retirement. Don't know what his disease is. Never was going to put him in a nursing home. Never, never, never. I would never. I had the same idea. I would never do that to him as if it was a punishment. Well, his care got to a certain point at home in the community. I had four caregivers at home where I had to surrender him to a setting that had more immediate direct impact for his care that I couldn't do. Total, we call it total care, right? Yeah. He can't speak, he can't walk, total care. Right. He deserves that total care. You know, people can't move, can't talk, suddenly they're broken, you put them over here. 
Some people have said to me, you know, it is what it is. He's in an appropriate setting, move on with your life. Unfortunately, that is a belief system that people have because we believe as advocates, that's just an informed denial they're living in, that they're never gonna get sick, they're never gonna age. So when you ask yourself that question, when I age, when I get sick, and it's a when, right? It's a when, like 99% of us are gonna need that kind of system and support at some point, whether you're there for a day, two weeks, my husband's nine years. Um, people live in nursing homes. It is their home, it is their family, it is their community. Um, what would you want is what we're very confused about. So what we've come to is that we understand that until it happens to you, you talk to a lot of people who work in the space of aging and they have the same baffling question. How come, is it people that just, they don't care? What is it? I think it's more of a human, humanity thing until it happens to you. Yeah, and it's also a very person, we talked about that, that personal emotional connection. This is your husband or whether it's, it's that or your parents. And I think a lot of people have to t come to grips with that um, in terms of how I'm and my family are going to treat my parents when they get to that age. And, and who is the one that has to step up right. and then what that looks like. What that looks like, right? right? And, and how manageable is that for someone? Is And then to have trust in that care. So if they want, they can go live their life, but also, so you know what I mean? It's, they're, they're, right. it's, it's a very, it's a very difficult um, time that you look throughout life. And I think about things that you're not ever really prepared for. That's right. Like, this is one of them. That's exactly, right? that's you, exactly you, you, right. Because they don't teach you that in school. That's exactly you, you know, right. And whether you're in high school, college, element, no one says, hey, here's, here's what's going to happen. Right. Here's your rubric for how to care for your parents. Right. So that there needs to be systems in place to be able to trust that, right? Correct. And yeah. you, you nailed it on the head where you say, what does it look like? Which mm -hmm. I think was one of your earlier questions about um, the, the hearing the other day. They yep. don't know what it looks like, you know, um, they, they haven't been through it yet. And even if they have been through it, they sort of know what it looks like, but there's always money attached to the solution, right? So what does it look like? Everybody is different. And that's one of the answers we say in a lot of the work in the aging space is it's part of the barrier is not one size fits all. So when you're talking about someone getting sick immediately, what does that look like for that person is different for that person is different for that person. Mm -hmm. But the person centered care, at least in a long term care facility setting per the resident rights law is you create that plan around them and then you create a team around them. And that isn't happening right now. Like, Right now on the front lines per our earlier presser, we don't know who to call in, in different facilities. Who are we supposed to call if, if my husband needs this or that or this? And it's like a total chaos of communication because I think the space is in a huge transformation. But in that transformation, like which are long gains, even though they should be more immediate, I mean, you can be more immediate through programmatic and transformative programs versus waiting for legislation to pass yeah. eight years later, yeah. um, which is what we've been you cursed with, you know, Cuomo signed my bill in March 29, 2021 to get us in, which was a year and a half later, but I got, you know, I got in through another lawsuit. And then that's the interesting part of the space is everybody just starts to sue each other. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah, everything's yeah. a lawsuit <laughs> right, yeah. over care. Yeah. So, I mean, it's very um, interesting. So to your question about what does it look like for you, it is hard to look at until it happens to you. And I think that that's the compassion we have for people who aren't in the space, but there needs to be more space and investment and monies toward this is what it could look like, you know? You could have sufficient staffing right now. You could before five years from now and before three years from now. How can you do that? Treat your workers better, pay them more, create incentives. You wanna retain them? You won't have your staffing crisis if you actually on the front line have incentives built in. But the narrative is, oh, our nursing home workers get taken by the hospitalists. They give them incentives, pay them more, they have more money to pay them. I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> Take me into the process of getting that bill done. Uh, back oh. in 2021. You mentioned a year and a half. If you have a rubric for somebody trying to move forward themselves with something, I guess, what, what well, was it honest, like? Was, I had no glimpse. idea what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> no idea. I'm, I tell people I'm not a lobbyist. You know, I'm a consumer advocate. Mm -hmm. And I wrote a New York Times article um, that I had written outside of my husband's nursing home. Um, that was basically my heart bleeding on the page in my car about looking at his window and I couldn't get in. And that was published in May, 2020. So then it hit me every time I was on a call with a politician or telling them, you know, I was in every day and they looked at you kind of cross-eyed and or stone-faced or like, you don't understand. I do this for him. I do neurosensory, I do speech, I do. And if I'm not in there doing that and that's not being endorsed, it's definitely not being endorsed during the COVID where there's no staff in there. Right. Cause now we understand sort of what happens. Yeah. Um, not sort of what happens. 
Um, and um, Senator May contacted me and said, what would a bill, like, what would it look like if, you know, we had a bill that you would never be locked out again? So it was a process of them understanding that, yes, there's people that go into nursing homes daily and daily care for their loved ones. I do four to six hours. Um, it's lessened a little bit over time because the staff has gotten to know him and there is a, you know, a care team in a perfect world around him. And, but you still supplement the care. Um, and then, so, um, you know, I wrote out um, different ways it could work. And then some of the legislative aides got a hold of the wording and, you know, it progressed. And we just kept doing rally after rally after rally after rally, meeting after meeting after meeting with politicians. And they're like looking at us and, you know, in the, in the Zoom, um, trying to get us documented. And it hit me that like we weren't really documented before. I mean, people have been in nursing homes serving their families for decades. My mother ran nursing homes. Mm. There were those few family members that would come every day. And that's what essential care visitor represents, those people. And um, we weren't documented. So, well, yeah. that's that's what I want about growing this organization, this yeah. movement, because you mentioned you know, we, we were talking a bit off camera about other lobbyists that have millions of dollars to go put out ads and, and do what they have to do to, to get their message across. Right. You have a very different movement because you're, you're sort of coming from the grassroots, you're, yeah. right? At the end of the day, you're, you're finding your niche through your voices, through these rallies and through stuff like this. It's you grassroots know? and I think there's a consumer disconnect where because we're family members with loved ones who are ill, that the way someone hears you is like, oh, that's just the family member that's upset. Oh, that's, and they, but yet the, the, the reality of it is, is that I'm a family member who has had to read every single law in order to make sure my husband gets his service and then pass that on to other family members because most family members, and to your point earlier, when this moment happens to you, you don't know you don't know the system navigation. You don't know care transitions. You don't know what I'm supposed to do, who I'm supposed to ask for what. So Essential Care Visitor actually provides that space for the caregiver as well as we help them in the moment. We're all frontline real time is what we say. Frontline real time. You know, I got calls last week from California, Florida, because, yeah. and it's a different state, but that one moment on the front line is always about, I don't know what I'm supposed to do or where I'm supposed to get help. And it could be anything from, advocating on the front line in a nursing home where you know my social worker hasn't returned my call in three weeks to um to do you know the best kind of pillow for how to position uh, you know so it's 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 not one size fits all but what's different about us is that we're there front time you know front line real time where it's not a referral we're not you know going you know so that's it's grassroots but we also asked for funding recently that we will announce with you first in october um for some of the patterns of services that we've been able to do on the front line that are getting funded and will launch in october clearly the the editorial resonated you got you heard from lawmakers at that yeah what up you, you talk about other other people like you yeah. How often do you hear from them? Is that a common thread that All you've the time. seen as, as front line, real time? Right. I mean, you always, you always line, seem to have other people and that right. are saying, "Yes, I feel this too. Yeah. I, I see this too," which shows you it, it goes beyond just your personal story at the end of the day. Because well, there's right. more stories like you. Right. And I think that that's an interesting part of how Bob and I, my husband Bob, I call us like we when he got sick, we made a commitment because it was devastating. Believe me, we were in Maine six months of the year. Um, and I had a job where I worked virtually and traveled, and then six months of the year we were in New York. Well, when he got sick, I had to make a decision of where we were going to be for his care. So all of his neurologists are in New York. So we moved back to New York, and um, we just looked at each other and we're like, well, wherever we land, we'll help people, because that's our family legacy. Wherever we land, we'll help people. So it is an actual kind of order from him, even <laughs> though he's nonverbal and he's very much alive. Everybody loves him at his care facility, um, whereby everything we do is for the next family members so they don't have to suffer with what we had. No, we were stuck at an institution in Boston for three months because we couldn't get placed because of the long-term care fiasco of what happens when you need to get placed. Yeah. You know, they look at your assets, they look at, you know, how long those private assets will last, they'll look at how long it'll take for them after you apply for Medicaid to get reimbursed, and they're not supposed to accept you on those terms or not accept you or do, that's discrimination, there's a law against that, but that's what they do. And so you're left to, okay, am I gonna be, is my husband gonna be stuck at Harvard for, you know, forever? And so it took a long, it, the placement, it's chaotic when it happens, back to your earlier point. Mm -hmm. You're like, 1-800, I don't have the tools, how do we do this? And I think <clears throat> the peer-to-peer -peer model of helping another family member is beyond impactful um, for a consumer. And we, 
people are like, how can I ever repay you? We say, pass it on. Hmm. Pass it on to the next person you meet because you, you don't know what you don't know until you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know? <laughs> True. And then you learn on the go, right? Which right. kind of what feels like that's what you've been doing. Like you said, you, legislation and all that was very new to you. Right, it was very time. new, but I yeah. knew that one thing. I knew that my husband deserves dignity, whether he can walk or not walk, whether he can talk or not talk whether he's considered disabled, and he is, whether he's residing in a nursing home or he's, right, he's residing at home. So that he takes his last breath, he deserves dignity, as does every person who's aging. You know, we all deserve to be treated um, in a humane way. That's our human right. And in a long-term care setting, it's their resident right attached with all the other four laws. Um, which is why, um, you know, I work so hard at it because it comes from the gut and it comes from this moment when I was writing the New York Times article where I remember looking from my car going, I'm going to get in there. I'm going to get in there because this is wrong. You know, whatever guidance was being written, whatever, however that was playing itself out, which was a whole lot of, and I do believe to your earlier, earlier question about was everyone doing the best they could. I believe everybody was doing the best they could, but within that framework, the best that they could is looking at nursing homes in a certain kind of a way where the vulnerable that live in there don't matter. And that is not okay. So when I was writing the New York Times article, I'm like, my husband is in there, he cannot speak for himself, and he matters. And it's not okay to separate him from his wife, and it's not okay to treat him as if he doesn't matter and he's gonna die anyway. You mentioned the dignity. Dignity. And, and, and it was um, it, interesting enough that a few weeks ago now, the proclamation. Tell us what went into that and, and that moment uh, for you and him to be recognized, and why was he recognized, and, and, and you at the same time? So basically, um, it's his 70th birthday this year, and I have big ideas <laughs> all the time. <laughs> so I thought, you know what? He is a nonverbal, disabled human being that has a gargantuan spirit that served the Board of Ed for many years in special ed in New York City, that is a musician that had three bands, and that resides in a nursing home. And I think he deserves a proclamation from the mayor. So <laughs> I... <laughs> asked the mayor if he might acknowledge my husband with a proclamation and um they uh, did they uh, they they did and and they wrote this whole thing up it's hanging in his mm -hmm. his room in the nursing home yeah. so every aide that goes in there knows bob is <laughs> there is a robert victor viteri day on july 1st 2020 mm -hmm. and that you know he's not um a person that is a human being that you might visualize that can't move or can't talk he's not a piece of portoplasm he's a living breathing magnificent um human being that's my husband and so the nypd jazz band came and if you guys want to ever hire them they're free <laughs> and <laughs> right. there was 25 well, of them right taxpayer money no, free. Well, okay, taxpayer. Okay. we're not in new york city we're but not, they we're not were paying amazing taxes. i gave him a list of all his songs that he sang in his bands mm. and they played every single one of them and my husband who is mostly very still because of his motor disease that has no name um woke up through the whole concert and at the end actually was trying to talk to the band member like it comes out the motor when it aligns can come out it's it's it sounds yeah but it's his language yeah and i think the cops all of them were crying everybody was crying yeah but yeah. um so he got his emotional moment yeah because it 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 teaches us that um as long as you're breathing um here no matter what form you're taking we need to respect human life. It's a tribute to his legacy, too, of, of his impact, you know, and a recognition of that at the same time. And just because, you know, the way he is now, whatever that might be, he's still here, and we should honor him for that. Honor right? him, and, and he lives in a nursing home, yeah. and, and he's still alive. And nursing home residents aren't, um, they're not they're not um, invisible, mm -hmm. you know, they, they matter. And I don't know how else to scream to the world, you know, but other than to say, if you had a loved one in a nursing home, would you appreciate them not getting fed, not getting moved, not getting bathed, not getting out of bed? Would that be okay with you for your child, for your parent, for your grandparent, for your husband? For, for my husband, he gets out of bed every day. And um, I make that happen. I mean, it's been a lot of advocacy on the front line, but I know the regulations, which is what we want to teach the world because 
if a facility says, oh, we don't have enough staff to get your husband out of bed, well, then you get the staff to get him out of bed. You're violating his rights and you're committing a crime. You're collecting money off of him daily, all of them, and you're not delivering the care. I always compare it to going into the restaurant and ordering a hamburger. I mean, a hamburger, <laughs> right. you know, and the guy comes out, you order it, you pay for it. I'm sorry, we don't have a hamburger and we don't have any way to serve it to you, but I'm going to keep your money. Hmm. It's the same thing. <laughs> yeah. You're in it for him, but like you said, you're in it for this bigger picture of long-term changes to the system. And you look at, <clears throat> at the state level, that master plan for the aging, the governor signed in it to 2022. We're expecting something in 2025. They said they want a final draft by then. We know July, we were supposed to see a, a draft or whatever um, at that point. Where, where are we in that? What do you want to see in that master plan for the aging, which hopefully, I mean, for you would probably hopefully address some of these things long term. Correct. So I sat on four different subcommittees of the Master Plan for Aging and I was asked, it was an honor um, to sit as a consumer and I sat on the informal caregiving uh, committee, um, the long term services and supports, which is care transition, tr transitions and system navigation. That's a long, that's a I long know. <laughs> and cognitive health, which I was very interested in that space because of how when someone uh, might be fallen ill with a brain um, mm -hmm. condition like my husband did, what that first moment is like because we were thrown a bunch of medication and said good luck with that mm. from a particular medical system and that's not okay because you go home alone and you're like what mm. I'm supposed to give like it's yeah. your it's a mess yeah. and um, it's it, right yeah. and um, and also communications for informal caregiving and um, and so basically the master plan for aging was in a grueling process where a lot 400 different stakeholders came together and through years of their space and time and then um, and then I was a consumer voice saying, oh, you thought about this, you think about this, with nuances, because people behind the desk don't, they have no idea what happens on the front lines. Let's just be fair, like they don't, unless you're there every right. day, you don't. Yeah. So we have to inform him, you know, inform them with our consumer advocacy. And, um, and we're waiting for actually the July report to come out, and right. it hasn't yet. And so um, the word on the street is that it's with the governor's office. But the hope there is that the pro I made two huge recommendations as um, um, as a family caregiver, and hopefully um, that they'll be enlisted in there. And then the bigger hope and a request to the governor is that you put money attached to each thing that anybody has recommended because I don't know if that was part of the plan but it absolutely better be part of the plan because you're talking about a billion dollar industry in this aging space billions of dollars and as you heard Becky earlier mentioning these data points of how much is actually spent on our aging and disabled it's nada mm -hmm. and the question is why why you you, you know why 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 it, which I believe in one of the recommendations I put forth for a programmatic. I was going to ask what they were, yeah. Um, well, one is it was, it was a family frontline uh, program. I think is getting, I, I can't announce it yet, but I'm hoping <laughs> it is getting. And it actually will lessen all the lawsuits and the back and forth and, and it'll and improve quality care. So, um, but I was, I was uh, nursing home specific. And then also there was a lot of discussion on, um, I'm not, I, I guess I can't talk about it uh, on the record, but there was just a lot of process that went on and yeah. a lot of heart and soul that went into that MPA and still is, and we're waiting for the report. So we'll see what happens <laughs> with the report. Talk about it when the report and, comes and I'm a consumer, can <laughs> yeah. I can say to the governor, you know, please attach money to any programmatic suggestion that has been put forth because it's for the people of New York, it's for the aging space, it's for if we are an age-friendly New York, then we got to put our money where our mouth is, you know, and to do anything less is unacceptable. Are you concerned at all about the Medicaid conversation across the board with this population when it comes to that? Because I know you look at the budget, if you're not familiar, the two biggest chunks of the bud state budget right now are education and Medicaid. Right. And that's where you look at the big parts of the budget, that's usually where you start. And there's been proposals out there that haven't gone too well because of, you know, pushback, because of the the needs of people in society. Both we saw that in the education market. Right. Are you concerned in some of your initiatives of that conversation about that I'm, factor? I'm I totally fascinated by the Medicaid conversation. Mm -hmm. And I did a deep dive on it with actually a provider who they did get a seven and a half percent increase effective August 2024 mm -hmm. to serve our loved ones in this long term care setting. But the provider side wanted it to be retroactively like 16 years ago. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't retroactive that far back. 
But the argument they always have is even with that increase, we still don't have enough money to serve care. So my question as a consumer is, I've never understood that answer because then why are you operating your business? And why are you so concerned about the profit of your business versus the care? So our goal is to move the needle where the, uh, and there was another reform piece that Cuomo put forth, 70% care, 30% profit, right? And those percentages, you can do a deep dive on our website. And, um, and so my question is though, what's the problem? You have a human being in front of you, you're committing and selling ads that we, we do compassionate care, and bring your loved one here and da 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 da. And um, you're saying you can't serve them until you get the money? Like I get very actually confused as a consumer because I don't believe that's an answer to not serving the direct. Well, we'd serve more care if the numbers were right. Yeah. What is, so that, <laughs> So what do you do in the meantime? You just neglect, dismiss, and ignore, and people decline, and they die. But what I've also found fascinating about this space is they do decline in a nursing home, and guess what? You, they get picked up on hospice, right, and palliative care, which is a higher reimbursable, and then they get okay again, mm -hmm. and then they're back off again of that, and they get re So yeah. there's a money, um, the economy of care is always sort of seems to disregard the actual consumer you're supposed to be serving, and the regulation says that each facility should be always operating in a way where they're doing what's best for the resident. That's not happening right now. We'll finish up with this. Uh, you talk lovingly about your husband, the inspiration behind all of this. Yeah. How much does he motivate you every day? Every breath I take. Um, you know, I feel very lucky actually and very honored to be his wife. And I am um, daily pinch myself because I know what love is and I always say that and he has a we have it all over his room you know love is all there is and that was the theme of his birthday party by the way so I had a bunch of NYPD officers of love is all there is love <laughs> they love their badges um and what I've learned is what love is and we don't we talk through our eyes like this morning I saw him before I came up here and I'm like you okay and he gives me this eyebrow raise you yeah. you know and I took a vow, you know, to in sickness or in health. And I've never considered him a burden. I've considered the whole experience an opportunity to be of service. And that's just how we are as people. And that's how we've responded. And not everybody's the same way. People have a lot of fear around disability and illness and chronic illness. But my invitation and our legacy's invitation is to find the joy in it and find the humor in it. You know, like literally when he got diagnosed, he looked at me across the kitchen table and said, well, at least we know how I'm going to go. At least that's clear, right? Because life can be unclear and yucky and messy. And, yep. and especially now in this climate and this election year and mm -hmm. the world seems like it's turning upside down. But one thing I know that I have is I have uh, my husband and I have love. And we have, you know, um, so many blessings around us to make it possible for him to um, communicate to the best of his ability. And so... Um, I'm honored to be his wife, and I've said that in our budget hearings. I will be his right by his side till he takes his last breath, and that's my response. I always tell my mom. My mama always says to me, "Not everyone's like you. You can't. You can't <laughs> think everybody. You know." But it's like, well, I didn't know I was gonna. Again, back to the point. You don't know if it's gonna happen to you. Yeah. I didn't know how. If you asked me ten years ago, I'd be like, "Oh my God, what?" Mm -hmm. But that's how God plans it. You know, He, he doesn't give you what you can't handle, and. Um, I can handle this. During COVID, I didn't know if I could handle this, you know, and I think that that's one of our big cries as well, that it's in the MPA is a call to create space and time for these healthcare workers and family consumers on our PTSD, because it is complex, it's vicarious, and um, even going to the hearing on Tuesday, I had, I was scared. I was in the same room as a, a, a leader who was separating us from my family. There's a whole lot of um, complicated emotions and trauma around that. So um, I feel that um, it's one day at a time. Like if you're a caregiver, you take it one day at a time, sometimes one hour at a time, um, but you look at the joy of it because it is a joy and honor to serve somebody who cannot speak or walk for themselves. And I think that that's the other gift is that um, every day I get in the car, I get up, I drive, I'm, I'm grateful that I can, I just stay in the gratitude of it. Um, is it sad? You know, it, it can be, you know, grief is real. Um, and I navigate through that. But what I do know is that, um, that he, he's grateful. So 
Yeah, advocacy built on love. There's, well, there's something there is, to be said for that. Well, right? but let's see how powerful love is. Mm -hmm. Like if you, if one can find it, you know, it's all about how you look at it. And that's how we lived our lives pre him getting sick, um, was always gratitude. We wake up, do gratitude lists. What are we grateful for? You know, um, we're grateful for the things that aren't going our way. You know, this didn't go our way. I mean, yeah. we, I wanted to be in Maine six months. <laughs> this is not <laughs> right. going our way. Living your life. Yeah. But it went another way. And so, okay, you bloom where you're planted is what we say. So we are so close to so many frontline caregivers that take care of him and have grown to love him. And, um, and this is in the family setting where you learn. I mean, we've been there nine years. So after, you know, usually people live in a nursing home one and a half years, two years, you know, but his, he's here. So what better way to spend time there than, you know, to help others. So we do the best we can. So um, I, I'm honored to be his wife and I feel like the luckiest girl in the world. Marcel, really appreciate your time. No, Thank you very much. No, appreciate the time and coverage Thanks. of this issue. Thank yeah, you. Thanks for coming in. Thanks for listening. Hit the subscribe button right now so you can stay up to date on these news-making conversations about the issues impacting New Yorkers the most, power and politics.